vast human potential already within us that we haven't tapped. And he told me about Joe and his work with Alpha Feedback, and so I built a little Alpha Feedback device, electronic, that made a tone whenever the person showed Alpha. number of years ago where I predicted that the EEG biofeedback would go nowhere. <laughs> and boy, was I wrong on that. Trust in, in what your teachers are saying, but verify. Verify. My name is Les Femi. <clears throat> I'm a psychologist in private practice in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, let's see, I worked for my PhD at UCLA and I did a year's postgraduate training at the Brain Research Institute at UCLA also. <clears throat> um, I've been on the trail for um, the grail, as I put it, <clears throat> since uh, probably 1966. And it all started when my dis dissertation showed that um, information is transmitted from the eye to the brain uh, in, in uh, packets very thin packets, the thin in time, so uh, uh, simultaneous activation of, of various uh, neurons in the optic nerve would fire and then they would go upstream, maybe a thin packet, as thin as, as say 5 to 10 milliseconds in, in uh, <clears throat> duration. And they would travel up through through the system to the cortex and carry enough information for the animal to function uh, perfectly. In other words, these five to ten second packets contained all the information that the monkeys needed. And yet, when we uh, don't observe under these special uh, circumstances, which I call retroactive perceptual masking in monkeys, and we just uh, show them a stimulus, the length of the, <clears throat> the perturbation of the optic nerve, the duration of the perturbation is much larger on the order of 10 to 20 times as much as this thin packet that still collects or, or, or still uh, holds all the information that the monkey needs to, to get a banana pellet which is very impressive to me, you know. That, so this is the coding of the nervous system, how information is processed in the nervous system. So I ask what other synchrony-related <clears throat> phenomena are present in the nervous system? And <clears throat> that was at a point when I left to go to Stony Brook to be an assistant professor of physiological psychology. And I pursued this, what about synchrony uh, suggests uh, is suggested in in, in uh, various forms. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I discovered or rediscovered really that when you um, <clears throat> when you uh, cause a person to narrow focus and grip on some subject that that person <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> desynchronizes the whole, the whole head. Say it starts with a visual image. Imagine a, something you want in, in the center of your visual attention. That will shut down the whole brain. In other words, all the frequencies go into beta mode, small amplitude beta mode. If you then release that grip, that narrow focus, that objectification <clears throat> upon whatever it was that caused the whole brain to shut down. As you release it, it comes back. The whole brain becomes more and more uh, locally synchronous. That is, there are more cells <clears throat> uh, 
firing and relaxing at the same time in any spot locally. And then if you look around the brain, you see that the whole brain is in fact in phase, in synchrony, and, and operating again uh, together globally. So that got me <clears throat> thinking uh, along a number of avenues. And we did some research uh, that supported uh, the idea that uh, when a person is paying attention in an objective way, that is in a way such that he knows that he's separate from the object of his uh, attention, <clears throat> uh, when that happens, uh, there is a, a simultaneous physiological event. Uh, that is, uh, say it was a visual object that he looked at, <clears throat> and <clears throat> what, what would happen would be that the occipital area would be out of phase with the phase relations of all the other parts of the brain. So the brain, the whole brain, minus the occipital area, is acting as the subject and the object of attention <clears throat> is the occipital robe. And in order for the object to seem separate and something graspable as external to the subject, the brain has to make a, um, <clears throat> it has to be out of phase. The, the brain uh, area associated with visual function has to be out of phase with the rest of the brain. That's how you objectify an object. If, on the other hand, you reverse that so that all the, the brain <clears throat> regions that you're monitoring are in phase with each other, there's no longer an area which is out of phase, okay, then uh, you lose uh, the object, the visual object. It's no longer a visual object to you. And you, it's like you merge with the experience become one with it, and, and to the point of even disappearing. Your, your consciousness disappears. It's like when you drive from point A to point B, a well-driven road, you drive it all the time, and one day you get home or you get to where you were going and you realize, gee, you know, I, I never, I wasn't there the whole trip. I don't recall being there at all. And yet here I am home, and it took about the right amount of time, and I must have not run anybody over and stopped at lights and made the necessary turns. How did I do that? What, what's happening here? Now, many people would be frightened by that, but I know that that is a form, a way of paying attention that is absolutely necessary for health and well-being. In other words, going from a narrow, objective mode of attention to a more diffuse, immersed kind of attention allows for the diffusion of, of uh, accumulated stress. So it's a, a very important ability to have. So we teach on-off training, you know, increase uh, synchrony of the whole head, including the uh, occipital area, let's say, and then decreasing, <coughs> decreasing um, uh, synchrony by putting the, the occipital lobe <coughs> out of phase alone. Mm -hmm. So uh, out of phase, in phase, out of phase, in phase. That's what we need, that's what our training should should include. Now, a lot of our education is, is so strongly biased for narrow objective attention. And even gym, the kids don't have to go to gym anymore. They, they don't play musical instruments like they did. They don't they don't get into uh, singing. They don't have any courses where they just sing together or do, do many of the things that are associated with, with um, <clears throat> uh, d diffuse and immersed kind of attention. When did you first become involved with the organization uh, about feedback? <clears throat> um, well, I was one of the founding members. Actually, uh, I existed as a, a biofeedbacker before there was a, an organization. I organized the first meeting of biofeedbackers in 1968 
at Snowmass at Aspen and invite, invited Mary, Mary, no, Brown, Brown. Barbara Brown. Barbara Brown. And, and, um, <clears throat> Stoiva and Bedinsky and Joe and Mulholland, a guy named Mulholland. And we had a piece of a, of a winter conference, neur neurological conference, and uh, ours was one of the, one of the panels. <clears throat> and I was the chair of that panel and brought it together. That was the first meeting of biofeedbackers. Biofeed there was one other person, I can't remember his name. And then the following year in um, <clears throat> Santa Monica, the actual formulation of the Biofeedback Society of America occurred. That's what it was called then. And we were thinking of calling it the Auto Regulation Society. But people felt it sounded too much like a, a car a car service, <laughs> so we didn't we didn't go with it. <clears throat> um, are there some predictions you have for the uh, future of the field? Predictions. <clears throat> um, it will survive. You know, it, it won't. It, it's got an uphill. Uh, problem here. <clears throat> I mean, there's so many competing forces out there that are so so much better uh, funded, like the MDs and, uh, and, and I, I guess that's the biggest opposition. They need evidence, as we do, but they're not accepting evidence that we accept. And, and we, it's so hard to get funding because you know, it's to nobody's benefit for us to get funding. And uh, I would like to see all the different meetings and societies join together. They should have been together from the beginning. I think it was very short-sighted and, and uh, poor p political process that, you know, got us all separated, why we couldn't have been in in one organization and have a thousand people at a meeting instead of 300 or 400. <clears throat> I, I look forward to that happening again, reuniting, which economics might force. <clears throat> Do you have some um, suggestions for someone who's new coming into the field? Most of um, my observations that led me down the path that I've been going for the last 40 years have been very simple observations, just seeing for myself what's true and what isn't true, and looking at simple things like whole head changes in, in synchrony just by closing one's eyes or opening one's eyes and, and, and uh, realizing that that the visual system isn't just what's being uh, affected by opening and closing eyes. The whole head is affected. The whole brain is affected. So, so I, I, I'm suggesting that people really just sit and look at what they're looking at anyway, but really stick with it and and understand the possible significance of what they're looking at. I was happily. Um, tutored by Donald B. Lindsley, who was one of the first in the field to recognize that alpha desynchronized and, and that young kids have alpha and it, it's at a low frequency in the theta range. And as they grew older, it became uh, more like 10 cycles a second. <clears throat> and um, but I went through the whole process. I proved to myself that what was true was true and what wasn't true. And I, I just kept thinking about it, you know, how interesting it was that the whole, the whole brain was affected by closing your eyes. You get these big alpha waves everywhere. 
what's the value of that? What's the significance of that? What, how did the brain use that? You know, what, what does the brain do with synchrony, basically? So it sounds like you're advising new people to be curious. <laughs> um, how does that say? Trust in, in what your teachers are saying, but verify. <laughs> verify. That's what you need to, need to do. You need to start like a babe, say, yeah, that's, I understand everything you're saying. I'm not saying it isn't true, but let me test it for myself. I think you got to do it yourself. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for taking some time with me this afternoon. When are you going to pay me? <laughs> uh, that will come right off the air. <laughs>